All right, well, this morning we're, uh, we're taking another set of steps in our lifelong journey to learn Jesus. We're uh, still cruising in the Gospel of Matthew, and now we're right in the middle of the nitty-gritty of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Through this teaching, as we've been seeing these past weeks, Jesus illuminates what his kind of life looks like. And he shows us the kind of life that God has always intended for us. He shows us how life can actually work. He shows us how life can actually work without blowing apart, without self-destructing, how life can actually sustain and maybe even flourish. Well, actually not maybe. How it can flourish and flourish for the long haul. How life will flourish for all of eternity. With extraordinary timeless relevance, Jesus is cutting right to the heart of life's most serious issues. These issues where we so often dehumanize ourselves. And Jesus comes and he rehumanizes us. He repairs the image of God in which we were created. In today's passage that we're going to look at, Jesus deals with the issue of faithfulness. Faithfulness in marriage and faithfulness to your word. So, what do you think with this issue? Could we use God's help in this area? That was a rhetorical question. (laughs) Again, you know, we could be tempted to think that, okay, you know, just because we haven't broken the seventh commandment, you know, about committing adultery, that, you know, hey, we're all good. But have you ever wrestled with issues of lust, of fantasies, pornography usage, maybe a longing touch of someone that you shouldn't have? Or maybe you've entered into an adulterous relationship. Maybe you've had serial fractured relationships in your life. Maybe you've experienced a family or a marital breakup. And maybe you've walked the journey of remarriage and figuring out all of that kind of stuff. Now, I don't mention any of this stuff to bring up old feelings of shame. That's not at all my intention here. Quite the opposite. I mention all of these issues to proclaim to you the good news that God sees our hurt, our pain, our brokenness, and he is ready and able to heal us. Jesus is here to save us from this horrible mess that we find ourselves in, and he invites us into a revolutionary new life of freedom. So let's... Take a look at the word here in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 27 and work our way through to verse 37. Jesus says, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, That anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven For it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes 
or no, anything beyond this comes from the evil one. What we've just read in this portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is connected to what Jesus has previously said in, uh, in, in the previous parts of his teaching. By confronting these issues of faithfulness that we just read about, about the adultery, the lust, the divorce, Jesus maintains the credibility that he had previously established. He is not abandoning God's life-sustaining law. Jesus isn't coming unhinged from the, the redemptive story of Israel. He's fulfilling the law, and he's fulfilling it to the full, to full life-sustaining power. His teaching looks back to the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and possibly even to the tenth commandment about thou shalt not covet your neighbor. <laughs> Jesus affirms, rightly so, that we shouldn't commit adultery. But then again, he looks through the letter of the law deep into the issues of the heart. Now, we'd be wise to pay attention to the connection points that get us to this part of the message. Now, we're going to return to the important part about salt and light in a moment. But let's first remember here the previous discussion that we had last week about anger and bitterness and contempt and the danger of giving those things a home in our hearts. What we saw is that our anger and our contempt could lead us into deception Deception could lead us into disobedience, and our disobedience leads to all kinds of destruction. And if we're wise, we'll take real careful uh, notice of that connection between deception and disobedience. It's a major biblical theme here, and it's running through Jesus' sermon as well. Now, I'm trying, the point that I'm trying to highlight from this part of the text is this, the connection point is that if you deal with your issues of anger, of bitterness, of contempt, then you've already dealt with one of the most significant roots that drives people to adultery, to lust, and to divorce. Jesus is laying out his message here for this way for a reason. Dallas Willard says that the sexual delight of marriage is destroyed by anger and contempt. So even before we get to this part of the passage, Jesus has already shown us the way out before we even get there. Now again, while affirming the seventh commandment, in our passage, Jesus looks through the letter of the law just deep into the issues of the heart. Because the mere fact that we just don't commit adultery, this doesn't mean that our relation to the other person in the domain of sexuality is as it should be. It's just not enough to stop committing adultery. We need to deal with the issues that get us here in the first place. And Jesus calls it out. It's the lustful imagination. Now, Jesus is not saying that we should never experience sexual attraction when we see another. I mean, that would be pretty much impossible. <laughs> you know, God created us with hormones like oxytocin and dopamine and estrogen and testosterone. And he did so with a, you know, for a reason. I mean, how do you think you got here? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? This is all part of God's created design, and this is how the world uh, that he made functions. And it is good. God declared it good. You know, how we steward these wonderful and these good gifts, that's the issue. And Jesus reveals to us that the issue of indulging the lustful imagination. Indulging the lustful imagination. Where we allow the imaginations... You know, where, where we allow these imaginations of the heart to go. To use a little phrase all the way back from Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The imaginations of our heart. Some of you may even remember my dad did a, a big teaching on that very concept about the imaginations of our heart. The pictures 
of our heart, our heart being the picture maker. <laughs> you know, Jesus reveals that the issue is indulging that lustful imagination. So the question is, what pictures do we allow to form in the imaginations of our heart? What fantasies or scenarios do we play out in the imagination of our heart? What planning of what I would do if do we allow in our heart? In some of those hidden inner commitments that we allow in our heart. Those are heavy questions. But those are very real and human questions. And Jesus hits it head on. Dallas Willard comments that the point that Jesus is making here with the lustful imagination actually is not unheard of or a new idea to God's people. What scholars believe to be the oldest book of the Bible, Job, in Job 31, we read Job saying, verse, uh, in chapter 31, uh, verse 1, we read Job saying, I have made a covenant with my eyes. See, Job surmises through the chapter that if he gives any license to his eyes, he would tempt the desires in his heart, and that would eventually find expression in his hands. Job made the clear connection. <laughs> From the earliest written book in the Bible, Job made the clear connection. The eyes to the heart to the hands. It's a fast progression. If we indulge. Just like the earlier struggle with anger, then leading to contempt. But maybe it never gets so far as full-out violence. Maybe it does. But it's just giving that thing a little bit of a room in your heart. Indulging it just a little bit. And then it takes on a life of its own. If we indulge the lustful imagination and let it have a home in our heart, if we let it have a life of its own, it will soon be acted out. Same thing that Jesus said about anger, he's saying here about adultery and lust. If we give it a place in our heart, if we entertain it, if we indulge it, it will soon be acted out. Now, it may be acted out, you know, maybe not to the nth degree, but to one degree or another, it will find its expression. Even if there's never an inappropriate touch, or even if a fantasy is never fully indulged, there may be just some sort of subtle violation of boundaries, where there's a set of emotional bonds and maybe some sort of intimacy that's occurred that shouldn't be there. Maybe you've heard the term Emotional adultery spoken by leaders before. You know, us humans are very crafty. We can follow the letter of the law here only to find some sort of way around it over here. The point is this. When the heart has been prepared and made ready, action will occur as occasion offers. And this is where Jesus is safeguarding us. This is where Jesus is saving our bacons. I mean, this is a heavy topic for sure. And, and you know what? Possibly some of us feel some shame over our history with these issues. But the good news is, is that Jesus forgives, Jesus heals, and Jesus has a way out. Jesus has a solution. In Jesus, it's all good news when we follow him. Forgiveness, healing, and a way forward, a way out. So what does Jesus tell us in the text? Jesus tells us to deal ruthlessly with our hearts and the first signs of lust. Like, do not give it an inch. Don't dance with the devil even for one second. Deal ruthlessly with it. Now, to emphasize the grave seriousness of the issue, Jesus deliberately uses these bold exaggerations. Like, he says, you know, like, if you have to, like, gouge your eye out and throw it away if it causes you to sin. 
Like what you're dancing with is this serious? Serious enough to... Or he says, cut off your hand and throw it away if it causes you to sin. This is how serious this road is. Now where Jesus doesn't exaggerate is in providing stark clarity on both the natural and the eternal consequences of playing with this fire. He says that if we don't immediately and ruthlessly deal with our hearts here, our whole body could end up in hell. What do you think? Is that pretty strong language? Do you think Jesus is serious here? Or is he just kind of me, 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 me? I think he's serious here, and it would be good for us to listen. Now, if you've ever experienced the consequences of sexual sin or adultery, I mean, you, you know very well that you don't have to die to end up living in hell. Part of the natural consequence here. Yet kind of the other issue is, is that the hell that we experience now might actually extend into eternity and go on forever and ever and ever. And this is where Jesus comes in. Jesus forgives, Jesus heals, and Jesus shows us the way forward and the way out. I like how N.T. Wright talks about this issue. He does it better, far better than I can, so I'm just going to read a quote from him. He says, Sexual desire, though itself good and God-given, is like the fire of Gehenna, which is sometimes translated hell. Gehenna, as you may remember, is that burning garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. Though good itself and God-given, it is like the fire of Gehenna, which needs firmly keeping in place. Saying no to desire when it strikes inappropriately, in other words, outside the context of marriage, is the most basic Christian discipline. This is not repression, as some people sometimes suggest. It's more like the pruning of a rose, cutting off some healthy buds so that the plant may grow stronger and produce better flowers. Choosing not to be swept along by inappropriate sexual passion may well feel on occasion like cutting off a hand or plucking out an eye, and our world has frequently tried to tell us that doing this is very bad for us. But for neither the first or the last time, we must choose to obey our Lord rather than the world. The beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus declared that his followers, the people who walk in the way of the kingdom of heaven, were salt and light, living demonstrations of the reality of the kingdom of God. Now, during the first several centuries after Jesus first taught this message that we're looking at, the surrounding pagan culture had noted how the Christians had a very different set of sexual behaviors. They're like, what's with these people? They're different. Rather than having a mistress on the side, which was very common in Roman culture, or engaging in cultic you know, temple, you know, engaging with cultic temple prostitutes, which was actually even expected within the culture as part of their worship of their various gods, the Christians instead... Get this, they were faithful to their spouses and they were exclusive to their spouses. And the surrounding culture is like, whoa, man, this is weird. What's going on here? Like the point is, they took notice. The church was salty. The church was shining a light. The church was revealing a new way to live. The church was revealing something revolutionary about this new life in God. Some of you may remember about six or seven years ago in a message that I delivered, I had quoted Pastor Kenny Luck from Saddleback Church in California. 
some of you may know about Saddleback Church. They have like 40,000 people who go there. They've sent, you know, tens of thousands of missionaries all around the world. Like Rick Warren is their senior pastor. They're like an amazing place. Now, Pastor, pastor Kenny, plus a few other leaders, uh, he had made several comments in a series of articles about some studies on the sexual behavior of people who profess to be Christians. Now, while there is still a, a significant statistical difference between Christians and the world around us, what they did find through these studies was that the numbers were still such, alarmingly so, that it led them to conclude that a very large swath of the North American Christian church are sexual atheists. The numbers for fornication, how many Christians were sleeping together before marriage, or just having hookups, alarming. The numbers for Christians who engage in adultery, they were alarming. The numbers for Christians that engage pornography, very alarming. Or an issue that's been in the last decade a topic of more discussion, the number of Christians engaging in polyamory, meaning like open marriages. I hate to say it, but I was involved in some high-level talks within the church where that issue was one of the issues being discussed that was on the table. But whether or not we should consent to Christians in polyamorous relationships Yeah, (laughs) indeed. Do you remember what Jesus was getting at when we were looking at the beginning of his sermon a couple, a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago? Like, what if those who are called to be light bearers had become a part of the darkness? Then what happens? In a few chapters, we're going to hear Jesus ask a question here, like, "Why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I say?" Good question, Jesus. Very good question. It should be no surprise to us that when the church speaks up on issues of righteousness and justice, that the message falls on deaf ears. What does Jesus say about losing our saltiness? We don't have the moral authority. We are not demonstrating the kingdom of God. So the message falls on deaf ears. The words of Jesus in his message here, they call us to decide which kingdom, which path. And he lays it out real clear the way of life, the way of death. It couldn't be more clear. Now next in our passage, Jesus moves to the topic of divorce. Now notice within our whole passage today how the topic of divorce is sandwiched in between these two other topics that maybe it might seem more basic than something as complex as divorce. The controlling of our bodily lusts on one side and then the the issue of integrity and telling the truth and keeping our word on the other side. Now, the, the point of Jesus speaking of these topic, topics in this order is likely pretty obvious. If you can control your bodily lusts and maintain integrity, and if you can tell the truth and keep your word, there will be far less divorces going on. <laughs> far fewer divorces. On one side, the lust, and on the other side, the lies. Both will strangle a marriage. Now, recently on July 14th, on that Sunday, 
Bob did an excellent and compassionate teaching on the topic of divorce, going through all the scriptures and what uh, Jesus says here, 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 and what the Apostle Paul says and what, uh, what we see in the Old Testament. So uh, I would just encourage you to check that out on our YouTube channel if you want to dig deeper into the details and if this is something that you're really thinking about. Uh, again, thank you, Bob, for serving our family that, that well with that message. We, we do appreciate that. So rather than going in, in rehashing, uh, it's uh, probably not near as well as Bob did here. I just want to point out one thing here today. Is that when Jesus speaks into the issue of divorce, he's speaking into a context where a man could divorce his wife for whatever reason if she displeased him. Oh, honey, you gained a little bit of weight. Bye-bye. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, Seriously. And the Old Testament texts that we see on divorce appear to also reflect some loose attitudes towards the practice. Like there's, uh, without going into the details, like there's one obscure Old Testament law, I was just reading about this a couple of weeks ago, that looks like it was, it's there to prevent wife swapping. Like they knew that, you know, they had to be married, so they'd like divorce their wives and then switch around and then, you know, try and remarry their old wives and get like stuff like that. And the old test was like, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> it's like But but it's this kind of this kind of culture and mindset where uh where where we could uh discard people if they didn't if they didn't please us. Now Jesus is clear here. For our covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, covenant matters. God takes covenant very, very seriously. Far more seriously than we do. Which should probably shift. We should probably follow him in this. God takes covenant very seriously. I mean, keep in mind, God's plan of salvation, of redemption of the world, is enacted how? Through covenant. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Testament, the New Covenant. Jesus at the Eucharist, this is my new covenant in my blood. Covenant. Covenant is a big deal. God is a God who keeps his word. That's who he is. He is the faithful one, faithful to all his words, faithful to all his promises. So when Jesus is teaching us about telling the truth and about keeping our word, he's not giving us a, another new law here, another oppressive thing that we have to obey. No, no, no. He's doing something different here. He is leading us to become conformed to the image of God who created us. He's leading us into this kind of behavior, this way of life that makes us fully human the way that God intended Faithfulness to the marriage covenant isn't just about avoiding trouble. I mean, though there is that. (laughs) No, no, no. Being faithful in our marriage covenant becomes a reflection to the world of the faithfulness of God and his covenant to us. To redeem us, to restore us. Our covenant faithfulness is a reflection of his covenant faithfulness. We become living demonstrations of the kingdom of God into the world. It's how we're salt. It's how we're light that shines in the darkness. Faithfulness to our word is a vital part of of how life in the kingdom of God works. It's how we're able to sustain life and cause it to flourish. And this is why Jesus talks about keeping our word. I mean, yes, here in the context of serious issues like marriage, but then he takes it into more general territory here. The keeping of our word is so important. Because we can't sustain life. We can't have life flourish where there's no keeping of our word. Where there isn't integrity. Where there is not truth telling. 
fast forward to Matthew 12, verses 33 through 36, Jesus will tell us later on in the, on this issue. He'll come back to it again, and he, and, he, and he says that we will be held accountable for every careless word we utter. Being faithful to our word, holding integrity, meaning that what we say and what we do are the same. Telling the truth. It's important. Because Jesus says we will be held accountable on that last day. Faithfulness to our word is the way of the kingdom. Now, once again, not to get cliche with this, but when we get to this point of the teaching, you know, just hear the voice of your former pastor echoing from the great cloud of witnesses. Pause. Okay, right now, pause. Look again, look deeper into the word here. Like, what's the big issue? What's going on here? What is Jesus getting at? What's, what's going on really deep down in these passages. What's going on deep down is Jesus is speaking value into you. Jesus is speaking value into me. Jesus is speaking value into your neighbors. He's making this point. People are not disposable. You are not disposable. I am not disposable. Your neighbor is not disposable. Those neighbors are not disposable. That guy at work that you don't like, not disposable. There are no disposable people. We see this clearly in the words of divorce, you know, especially when we look at it in that context, that we just can't discard another person when they somehow displease us. People are not disposable. They're not to be treated that way. And likewise, we see this with how we treat other people sexually. People are not disposable. I mean, just think about the horrendous issues that we have, even in our own nation with human trafficking or various kinds of pornography. You may not know this, but the third largest web, site, web company, third in the world for web traffic, just below Facebook and Google, more traffic than Apple, more traffic than Yahoo, more traffic than Netflix. Think of all the data you burn through when you Netflix pitch. More traffic than Netflix. You know what it is? It's Pornhub. And it's a Canadian company. Parent company, MindGeek. Third most traffic on the internet in the world in our backyard. On one of our Hope Sundays, I'm going to talk about an initiative related to something with this. Like the back of this demon is breaking there are people across Canada and now across the United States rising up, and this thing is coming down. It's, it's such a great message of hope. But the point of even bringing this up is the way that people are treated and treated here in our own backyard as disposable trash for cheap thrills and gratification. People are not... Jesus says clearly, people are not disposable sexual objects for the gratifications of our lust. That's not the way of love. That's not about caring. That's about using and abusing. Just like the lies of contempt and how they spoke of worthlessness, so the deceptions around our lusts and marital unfaithfulness and all of this stuff, you know, they speak to that same lie of worthlessness. And they tempt us towards discarding people. Even people that we don't know, just people that are there on the internet, 
But that disconnection, that distance doesn't change the fundamental principle. People are not disposable. Everyone has value. Everyone. Now again, I like how Dallas Willard puts this. He says in the Sermon on the Mount here, and talking about all this stuff, like this isn't about Jesus giving new laws about things to be avoided, more heavy burdens being placed on our back. That's not what Jesus is trying to do. I mean, clearly when he's talking here, there are things that we are not to do. But that's not the point of what he's trying to say. Jesus is giving us a revelation of the preciousness of persons. This is the point. Jesus is giving us a revelation of the value of human beings. You are precious. You are valuable. Your neighbor is precious and valuable. In the kingdom of God, all people have tremendous worth. This is the picture that he's trying to reveal to us. And this is the picture that he's trying to get us to reveal to the world. You are the light of the world. Reveal to the world through how you live that everyone has value. Tremendous value. In the kingdom of God, we are valuable. How much are we worth? We are worth so much that Jesus paid with his life. He paid with his blood for you and you and you and you too and you back there and you way back there and you guys over there on the floor. All of you. Jesus paid for you with his life. That is how valuable you are. The creator God, the king of the universe gave everything for you. You are not disposable. You are valued. You are loved. So when Jesus talks about covenant, about marriage, about keeping our word, this is an expression of value and of worth. This denigrates worth. This shows worth. This speaks worth and value. And Jesus is leading us to speaking worth, demonstrating worth and value, demonstrating his kind of love. Jesus is taking us deeper into the kind of humans that we were created to be, the kind of humans that we truly are, the kind of love that God has for us and the kind of love that as we share it, it brings us into harmony with his life and frankly with all of life. Jesus is undertaking a complete transformation and renewal of our hearts and minds so that we can live in his kingdom. I love that familiar verse in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul writes to us, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. How we utilize these things is important. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to all the lies and the deceptions that degrade and devalue other people, that see them as disposable. No, rather... Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might discern the will of God and what is good and acceptable and what is perfect. And Jesus is engaging that process with us right now. A complete redesign into a new creation people, seeing the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image. I mean, going back to the very beginning of Jesus' message here where where we had the Beatitudes. I mean, think about that as a new way of living for faithful relationships, for marriages, for families. Imagine a world where those Beatitudes are true. Imagine families where those Beatitudes are true. Where our families are filled with meekness. 
where our relationships are filled with meekness, where, yes, we have power. We even have sexual power, so to speak, but we show restraint. Where there is hunger and thirst for righteousness in our relationships and our families. Where there is mercy in our families and our relationships. Where there is purity of heart in our family and our relationships. Where there is peacemaking in our family and our relationships. Imagine a world like that. Well, guess what? It won't be too much longer and you will not have to imagine any longer because the kingdom will come. And we will see that in its fullness. And the good news is that we get to taste it right here and right now as we follow Jesus, as we are transformed into his likeness, and as we shine that to the rest of the world. We can taste it now.